Okay, so welcome to the lecture on advanced topicality. Topicality is one of my favorite arguments in debate just because it's often underestimated. Topicality is actually one of the least common strategies that the negative ends up going for in Parley. It's extremely rare that it ends up happening. There's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one is that the topic changes every single round. And so there's not really a consistent approach to topicality that's made as a consequence. It's not like policy debate where teams spend, you know, uh, uh, they have entire topicality files that are 100 pages long for every single word in the resolution. In parliamentary debate, the topic changes every round, and oftentimes many topics aren't really conductive to running topicality, either because they define words in a way that there is no ambiguity or because the resolution specifies just a single possible topical plan text. So in many cases, topicality is sort of a um, um, sort of a dark horse strategy, so to speak. So the way that I'm setting up this lecture is I'm just going to walk through basically speech by speech and explain different advanced strategies and tactics that if you go for topicality, you should plan on using. But before I get to that, I also want to explore some of the justifications and some of the rationales for running topicality. So hopefully you already understand the key parts of a topicality shell. You should understand that every T shell needs an interpretation, a violation, a uh, set of standards or reasons to prefer your interpretation, as well as some voting issues. Hopefully you should also have a working knowledge of common standards, although I'll talk a little bit more about a lot of the different standards and why they're important. And finally, hopefully you should have a basic awareness of the offense-defense paradigm, because topicality is actually a lot like other types of more straight-up substantive arguments. You impact out standards, for example. And so awareness of offense and defense and how they function is critical to being a successful topicality debater. So just to start off, why topicality? Why would the negative decide to run topicality? So the first reason is that topicality is an independent out. Topicality is an independent out. In other words, everything else can go wrong in the debate. But if your opponent slips up on topicality, you can still win. There is no other argument, except possibly for theory, that functions quite like this. Topicality is independent from substantive issues. And so it doesn't matter if you're the negative and you screw up your disad, or you have absolutely nothing to say about their case. If you win topicality, it is game over. That is incredibly strategic. Second reason you might run topicality is that it deters the affirmative. That is to say that even the mere threat of being able to run topicality tends to constrain the number and variety of cases that may be read against you. This is true both in a general sense and in a specific sense. In a general sense, all teams are going to be working with the knowledge that they need to operate within certain confines or certain limits developed by the resolution. In a specific sense, if you get good at topicality and you make a habit of going for topicality frequently, you'll develop a reputation for being good at topicality. And that will force teams to really think about the types of affirmatives that they are willing to run even if, if they are, uh, you know, sort of uh, nebulously or marginally topical. So it can prevent teams from running sort of uh, squirrel cases against you just out of the fear that you might run topicality and beat them on it. A third reason you might run topicality is that it can be used to secure concessions in other parts of the debate. So, for example, one of the most common key arguments in policy debate is T substantial. Oftentimes, teams run T substantial with no intention of actually going for the argument. Rather, the purpose of running T substantial is to ensure that there are links to the negative disadvantages in the round. T substantial ensures that the magnitude of the link 
be strong enough for the negative to access their disadvantage. Because if a team was not substantial, then it would, I guess, go to follow that whatever disad length the negative read would also not be very substantial. The fourth reason for running topicality is that it is probably one of the most difficult arguments for an MG to answer if they have not adequately prepared for it. It's very difficult for an MG to answer. That's because a lot of the time, topicality is sort of an afterthought in affirmative prep time, especially if the app just sort of assumes that their case sounds pretty topical in the middle of the road. But winning topicality requires precision and attention to detail, which is not possible if you do not spend prep time on it. So topicality can be a way to catch an affirmative team off guard if they haven't done the necessary preparation work. So those are four reasons why topicality is a cool argument and why you might consider read it, reading it. But you shouldn't always read topicality. There are bad reasons or bad justifications for reading topicality as well. So one bad, uh, one bad reason for reading topicality is just to read it as filler. Like, I have nothing else to say. I may as well read T. Probably the worst offender of this filler justification are spec arguments or specification arguments. If you've ever run agent spec or funding spec or enforcement spec, the vast majority of the time these arguments do not fit what the negative needs to strategically do in the LOC. And it doesn't really make sense to run these arguments except as sort of a time waster or time filler. It's much better if you have nothing else to say to at least just make some case arguments that might be relevant at the end of the debate, rather than waste time in an argument that you know you will not be going for. A second bad reason for reading T is out of habit or out of obligation. The idea that I always have to read a procedural. You should only read procedural when it is strategic to do so. Otherwise, there are probably better opportunities for you to spend your time on in the LOC. Having said that, there are five different scenarios where you might consider running topicality, where it indeed may be considered strategic. So the first scenario where you might read topicality is when the affirmative is not intuitively topical. This is probably the safest condition upon which you can read topicality, is when some component of the plan does not pass the smell test. So, you know, you can think of cases as being either at the heart of the topic or being sort of at the fringe of the topic, like sort of in the gray area. So you want to be able to distinguish between the two and you know, if there's literature suggesting that some of these fringe cases are sort of not within the confines of the, topical, uh, the topic, it's a good reason for reading T because it can be a little bit easier to win at the violation level. Do keep in mind, however, that many teams who do run cases on the fringes of the topic know that they're on the fringe of the topic and they'll be ready to respond to topicality. So you do need to have some preparation available when you go for the strategy. Um, However, even if the affirmative has some really good answers in the MG for topicality, it's likely that they'll need to spend a lot more time answering the argument compared to the amount of time it took you to read the argument, just because the affirmative knows that they have to sort of play it safe and make sure that they cover everything adequately. So a second reason why you might read topicality is to secure your link ground. And this goes back to where, what I was talking about earlier with securing concessions and other parts of the debate. So if you want to secure link ground, topicality can be a way of doing that. A third reason for reading topicality is as a strategy unto itself. You are uh, of the mindset that you want to be a team that gets really good at topicality and read it on a very consistent basis, no matter what app the affirmative happens to be reading. This can be especially useful at topic area tournaments like MPTE, where you already know in advance what the resolutions are going to be, or at least what the general topics are going to be. Since you can do a lot of topicality-based research based on the literature ahead of time. 
Fourth reason why you might read topicality is to create a favorable time trade-off. And this is different than simply reading topicality as filler or as uh, something you read out of habit. But you can read topicality if you think that you can get the MG to spend way too much time on it. So if you want to create a favorable time trade-off, probably the shell that you read will take no more than 30 seconds or so. And you will hopefully be aiming to have the affirmative spend at least over a minute on it. That can be a favorable time trade-off, but you should only do it if you think that you have other arguments that require extensive coverage coming out of the LOC. So if you're reading a strategy that doesn't require extensive coverage by the MG, then reading topicality as a time trade-off might not be the best idea. And finally, as a final note, don't forget to account for judge preferences, meaning that not all judges are going to be down for topicality in the same circumstances as other judges. You know, some judges will just be like blanket. I don't really like to vote on topicality. It confuses me and it's complicated, and I think that uh, most teams are topical to begin with. So obviously topicality is not a strategy you'd read in front of those judges. So be sure to read a judge philosophy before the round starts. Okay, having said that, now I want to go through the, every single speech in the debate and sort of lay out the fundamental principles of, I guess, advanced tactical decision-making for each speech. So, the PMC. Um, in most cases, the PMC should not incorporate anything related to topicality. Sure, topicality is a stock issue if you want to get old school, but the presumption is always that the affirmative is topical. And so there's no need for the affirmative to discuss topicality. The only exception is if your case uses a uh, creative interpretation of the topic, meaning that you know ahead of time that you're probably going to be baiting topicality, or if the relationship of the case to the topic is unclear at first glance. In the resolutional analysis, you might include a brief, were topical explanation line somewhere in there, just so that the judge isn't completely weirded out by your case. Right? It's not so much that you're doing it to, um, because of its utility in answering topicality or preempting topicality. Rather, you're simply trying to allay confusion on the part of the judge. And so you just want to make sure that the judge doesn't think you're crazy or misheard the topic or something. So the LOC is really where the vast majority of topicality debates are going to begin. So, at the interpretation level, strong topicality teams will do a couple of things. First, identifying and generating interpretations begins by analyzing the resolution during prep time, pre-round prep. You need to analyze the resolution. You need to dissect it. You need to figure out what's going to matter in terms of topicality. And there's several things that you need to look at. First. Does the resolution allow only for a single topical plan? Many resolutions are some variant of the USFG should pass some bill, right down to the bill number. Right, there's one topical plan text, you're probably not going to even need to bother with topicality because unless the affirmative does something really stupid and doesn't defend that exact policy, you probably won't have a basis for running topicality. So in that case, you can simply determine that right away and then move on and prep to other things. Pay attention, second, pay attention to who the actor in the resolution is. The actor can be important in, top, in discussing topicality because in many cases, the actor drives the production of literature about the topic. So if the actor is the federal government, for example, you might be able to find a definition whose source comes from a federal government report or from law or some sort of other federal publication. So the actor can be important. So you should take note of that and then use that when you're trying to find an interpretation. Third, look for words or phrases that have multiple substantive meanings. So if you remember from, I think it was... Monday, one of the practice topics was the U.S. Should, should significantly increase military aid to Ukraine. So within that resolution, what phrase would you think might have multiple meanings? Military aid. Military aid, exactly. 
Military aid is sort of a term of art, but it probably doesn't have a single stable interpretation. What is military aid? You know, military aid could be all forms of military assistance except ground troops. Military aid could be uh, weapons and financial assistance. There's a bunch of different interpretations for military aid, and so you can draw on those ambiguous phrases as the basis for running topicality. Look for phrases with multiple meanings. Fourth, did the topic writer screw up? It happens. Topic writers often screw up. They may make grammatical mistakes in the sense that they mean to say one thing but actually say something else. So, they may also make substantive mistakes. So for example, at the Great Salt Lake Tournament a couple years ago, one of the topics was that the uh, International Criminal Court should rule in favor of like, I don't know, I think it was granting protection to dolphins or something, or dolphins or whales or something involving uh, over, overfishing. Uh, the, the problem with that resolution was the court case in question was not before the International Criminal Court, it was before the International Court of Justice. Two different things. Sometimes the topic, uh, the topic writer will screw up, and so if you can identify when that happens, you can take advantage of it and run topicality if the AF tries to be uh, like, well, the framers screwed up. No, you should be like, you need to defend what the resolution says exactly, even if there was a mistake. So identifying errors in the resolution can be a good way of starting your analysis. Okay, so that's four things you should do in prep. So once you've done all that, hopefully you should nail down what phrase or what word you want to focus your T-shell on, and then uh, at that point, you want to develop your interpretation. So when we develop the interpretation, you need to do a couple of things. First of all, you need to find the best possible source for your interpretation. Typically, that means looking at topic literature, literature that is relevant to the topic. Occasionally, there may be instances where it's appropriate to just use a dictionary definition, and that's especially true when you're just defining one word, but the best interpretations will always draw on the topic, especially if you're defining a phrase that is a term of art. Second, if possible, you should try to define phrases rather than words. So, for example, one of the topics at the MPTE in 2013 was the USFG should adopt a cybersecurity strategy substantially increasing regulation of critical computer infrastructure. So there are many words in that resolution, but you want to narrow down your key, your key interpretation phrases that combine some of those words. So for example, rather than run T strategy, you should run T cybersecurity strategy. It's much more specific to the topic at hand and it lets you better utilize topic literature. Similarly, instead of saying uh, computer infrastructure, you should define critical computer infrastructure because it's inclusive of the entire phrase and you can go and check the literature for instances in which that phrase is used. When you are crafting your interpretation, third, you should try to be as specific as possible in the sense that your interpretation should be extremely clear about what cases are topical and what cases are not topical. A common mistake that many teams make when they run topicality is they run an interpretation that is very vague. It doesn't really have much in the way of distinguishing a topical case from a non-topical case. If you can do a good job in your interpretation of distinguishing between the two, that makes it a lot easier when you're trying to answer affirmative we meet arguments during the MO. Fourth, when you're constructing an interpretation, you should read an interpretation that is relatively balanced. That is to say that your interpretation should not just be a giant middle finger to the affirmative. Your interpretation should actually give the affirmative a lot to work with. You should just Design your interpretation so that your, uh, the app happens to fall outside of that ideal balance. So good interpretation should allow for lots of topical affirmatives that happen not to be the app 
that, uh, the plan that the AF ran. Um, however, you also need a basis for excluding the affirmative from your interpretation. So, you know, don't just come up with a list of 10 topical cases and then in your interpretation drop whichever case is the one that the AF happened to run. You need some sort of basis for excluding the affirmative. So make sure your interpretation includes that. And finally, make sure that your interpretation can be grounded in at least two or three good standards. And so this is just a matter of being able to foresee how an interpretation might interact with different standards in the debate. And I'll talk about standards in a little bit. Um, yeah, so that deals with interpretations. Sometimes it might be a good idea to prepare two interpretations that are quite different just to make sure that the affirmative will violate one of them. So if you take the military aid example, you could come up with two different interpretations to military aid that don't overlap, and you will always ensure that you will be able to run topicality, no matter which one they happen to bite. Any questions about interpretations? Okay, violation. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. However, many teams just make the mistake of simply asserting that the affirmative violates the interpretation. That's not sufficient. You can't just assert it. You need to have a nuanced explanation of why the affirmative violates your interpretation. So, if we're taking a military aid example, maybe you, you define military aid as um, weapons, all forms, all forms of uh, military assets except for ground soldiers. Maybe the affirmative has run a case providing advisors to Ukraine, military advisors who train uh, Ukrainian soldiers. The affirmative might try to argue that advisors aren't really soldiers in the sense that they're not like combatants. So if you are the LOC and your interpretation is that soldiers aren't topical, your violation needs to explain why advisors are soldiers. So, for example, you might say that advisors are just soldiers in disguise, sort of like Vietnam when we sent a couple thousand uh, military advisors to train South Vietnamese troops, right? It's sort of just a uh, euphemism for something else, which is the uh, obvious presence of ground troops. So be as specific as possible in explaining why the app violates your interpretation. Standards. So... Standards are reasons to prefer your interpretation. Standards are probably the part of a topicality show that is most frequently screwed up by debaters. And that is because every standard needs to have two different components. First, Every standard must have an explanation of how the interpretation captures the standard. If you are running a uh, topic literature standard, you need to explain why your interpretation captures the essence of topic literature. So you would literally just rat out all the different forms of topic literature that guide the interpretation. But that's only the, the first part of the standard. Many teams simply leave it at that, but they forget the second part of the standard, which is the implication, i.e., why does the standard matter? Why do we care about the standard? So if we go back to our topic literature example, maybe you're, the, first tar, the first part of your standard is, our interpretation is grounded in topic literature, and we are going to cite five different examples of literature that we, got, that we found our interpretation in including books, government policy, and maybe even like a military review report. That's great. You have multiple examples of topic literature, but I don't know why I should care. So have different reasons why topic literature is good. Why is it important for interpretation to be guided by topic literature? So first, at topic area tournaments, topic literature consensus can guide reasonable expectations for preparation. So if experts and policymakers in the field define a term and contextualize it all in the same way, then it makes sense to base their preparation off of that consensus. So that means that if teams deviate from the literature, 
the predictable nature of preparation goes away. And that's unfair for the negative because it means that all the time that they spend on prep is wasted because they're not able to adequately predict what the app was going to run. So that's an example of justifying why topic literature is important as a standard. Obviously, that was pretty long, so you may want to be a little bit more concise, but it's just one possible explanation. If you're running a, if you're running topicality as a strategy, meaning that you 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 planned it before the round that you were going to run topicality no matter what, it can make sense to really blow up standards in the sense that you have, you know, multiple different subpoints for why topic literature matters or why different standards matter. So, uh, for example, in addition to talking about fairness, you might also talk about why having interpretation grounded in topic literature is key to education. Right? So incentivizing debates grounded in the topic literature is good because it enhances the value of researching that literature. If you permit debaters to ignore definitions that come out of topic literature, then you devalue the importance of the literature base as a whole, which means that you get less topic-specific research being done. So that's another example of an argument you could make in terms of why topic literature is important. So some examples of other types of standards. So ideally, your, your interpretation should have, you know, three strong offensive reasons to prefer it. So some common standards. You know, I just talked about topic literature. Your interpretation is derived from the topic literature. Another common standard is ground. If you run ground as a standard, you need to do a couple of things. First of all, you need to exactly identify the ground that you lost. Be as specific as possible. So don't just say that we couldn't run disads and counterplans. Name what those disads and counterplans were. Also, lie. Claim that you had arguments that you prepped that you weren't able to run, even if you didn't actually prep those arguments. Nobody needs to know. Right? It just makes sense to do it because the more specific you are, the more compelling your abuse claim is. They didn't let us run these arguments, and so that's bad. Um, also explain why the ground that you lost was good ground. You know, ground comes in different forms and shapes. Some ground is just absolutely awful. It does virtually nothing for you because, you know, there might be issues with uniqueness, or maybe the links are really flimsy. So not all ground is created equal. Be sure to explain why the, why the ground that you lost was not just ground, but good ground and predictable ground. Yes? Um, how do you feel about the standard that some judges have that it's not actual abuse unless you run the position in its entirety? Like, it doesn't matter if you tell me that you lost this DA. If you don't run the DA, then you didn't actually lose it. Okay, yeah. So this gets to the question of potential abuse, i.e. there was potential for abuse to occur if you hadn't run your disad. The answer to that is it shouldn't be our burden to strategically undermine ourselves by running arguments that we know don't link. Like, that is nonsense. Like, the flip side of the coin is many teams will also try to say, you read a disad, ergo, we didn't abuse you. That's not necessarily true if the disad that you ran was, like, read off the cuff or it wasn't as good as the other disad you ran. You need to make that very clear that just because you ran topicality doesn't mean you are saying that we had absolutely no options in the debate. You're just trying to say that our options were made substantially worse from a strategic perspective. And so that's the best way to go about answering that. Because you should never, ever read an argument that you know does not link, even if you're trying to generate an abuse story on the dish ad. You just be as specific as possible about the ground that you lost up front. And that should be enough for most judges. Sure, some judges might feel otherwise, and so you probably have to adapt to that. But at that point, I would just make the dish ad literally last 30 seconds, just to be enough to like, give the judge an idea that it's not going to link but don't actually read the whole thing because you'd just be wasting time. Okay, so another common standard is uh, limits. Limit simply refers to the hypothetical size of the topic 
under a particular interpretation. So many negative teams will try to say that the affirmative under limits the topic if they are allowed to be topical, meaning that there are too many topical cases available to the app. That's bad for the negative because the more topical cases there are, the uh, less useful their prep time becomes. They can't look up specific arguments. They have to instead rely on generics and then pray that they link to all the different cases that are possibly, that the app might possibly run. Um, so uh, uh, some tricks when you run limits. So one thing you can do is you can provide a list of topical cases. So many affirmatives will complain that negative interpretations are over-limiting, meaning that they constrict the app to too few potential cases. One way the negative can answer that is to simply provide a list of possible topical, uh, topical apps under their interpretation to demonstrate that they don't over-limit the topic. So, you know, you can provide uh, maybe five different topical plan texts in order to prove that you are not over-limiting. That type of work should actually probably be done in the MO when you are extending topicality and you intend to go for it, since that can be pretty time-consuming for the LOC. Um, another cool trick, and again, you might save this for the MO, or you can read it in the LOC, is to say that there is a topical version of their app, i.e., had they made minor changes to their affirmative, they could have been topical under our interpretation. That is another answer to the argument that your interpretation overlimits the topic. You can demonstrate that there is something very similar that the app could have read that would have allowed you access to your ground or that would have preserved the value of topic literature. That can be a very strong argument to make. Also explain why limits are predictable. So there should be a basis for the limits that you identify. So oftentimes this dovetails with topic literature, right? Limits can be predictable if those limits are defined by reading on the subject. Another standard you might uh, consider reading is grammar. Grammar is relatively uncommon because it can only be used in certain circumstances. So basically, a grammar standard requires you to come up, come up with some grammatical basis for your interpretation that a affirmative counterinterpretation is not also able to claim. I see grammar constantly misused because the negative will simply claim that their interpretation is grammatical, which is great, but meaningless if the asked counterinterpretation is equally grammatical. So when you run grammar as a standard, you need to make sure that there's something funky about the resolution that makes it so that only your interpretation is grammatical. So for example, the word sanction is found in many topics involving sanctions, obviously. However, um, sanctions has four different meanings. And which meaning of the word depends on the grammatical phrasing of the sentence the word sanction is, mean, is, is used in. So sanction, first of all, it can be either a noun or a verb. As a noun, it can mean, one, a uh, penalty, usually financial, imposed on a country, usually a country or some other entity. Or it can be, uh, a sanction can be a expression of approval. As a verb, Sanction means very similar things. To sanction a country means to place sanctions on a country. However, to sanction something can also mean to approve of something. Those words have literally opposite meanings. But sometimes grammar can dictate which version of the word is correct. So one of the topics at GSL, I think from like three years ago or two years ago, was something like the World Trade Organization should sanction China's Great Firewall, the Great Firewall being their massive internet censorship program. Um, the AF, I, I was negative in this round, and the AF ran a case that put sanctions on China for having the Great, uh, the great Firewall, or the Great Wall, or I don't know what the hell it was, but the Great Firewall, I think it was called. So it put sanctions on China for doing that. We read topicality with a grammar standard saying that from a grammatical perspective, it does not make sense that you can put sanctions on an object because 
the word sanctions in the resolution was modifying the phrase Great Firewall, not China. Right? So we read topicality, sanction means to approve of. The only topical case is that the WTO has to approve of China's Great Firewall, which is literally the exact opposite of the act. Then we went all in on grammar and explained why our interpretation grammatically made more sense, even if it seemed, you know, at first glance to be a little bit contrived. We were just right in the question that, yeah, grammatically our interpretation is the only one that makes sense. And then we made a bunch of arguments about why grammar is important, gives every word in the resolution meaning, it uh, establishes limits, it does a lot of different things that are important for debate. So grammar can be cool if it works, but oftentimes it doesn't, so you should only use it rarely. Okay, um, I'm not going to discuss any more standard because frankly there's too many of them and I'm, I'm already running out of time. So, um, The standards you pick depend on two factors. So first, your interpretation of the topic, right? So um, the words, the phrase that you define should determine the standards you run. But also your reason for running topicality should, should determine what standards you run. So for example, if you run T substantial and all you're trying to do is uh, secure your link ground, the standard you would be most likely, likely to use is ground because you want to argue that the app being not substantial would let them spike out of your disag ground. So that's how we determine what standard we run. Um, also make sure your standards are diverse. So have a variety of standards that don't overlap. Gives you more options later on. Uh, voting issues in the LOC. Uh, fairness and education are voting issues, not standards. Voters, uh, voters are basically impact to your standards, so don't run fairness and education as standards, run them as impact to your standards. Explain why your standards matter in terms of fairness and education. Um, I hear jurisdiction as a voter a lot. It doesn't become relevant most of the time if the app reads a counter interpretation. Because jurisdiction is just an argument that if the app is outside the topic, you can't vote for it. It's kind of tautological, and so it doesn't make sense if the app also has an interpretation of the topic that they do fall in. Competing interpretations. Competing interpretations is another way of saying that the drug should default to an offense-defense paradigm, meaning that you should win if your interpretation is objectively better than the affirmative's interpretation. So competing interpretations can be good because it's not arbitrary, Right? The judge has a clear methodology that they can use to evaluate which interpretation is superior, and that in turn minimizes the extent to which the judge has to intervene to determine who wins topicality. So any questions about the LOC? Okay, the MG. Answering topicality begins in prep time. So in many instances, this is very easy. So if the plan text is the resolution, uh, you simply determine that and your preparation for topicality is done because you do not need to worry about topicality. However, in other situations, uh, the MG's job can be more difficult, especially if there are multiple potential phases the negative could define and run topicality on. So the LOC only has to pick one word or one phrase to define, but the MG has to prepare for every single phrase in the resolution, which means that there's a pretty big burden that goes on there. The MG obviously should not spend all of their time on topicality because, let's face it, many teams are not going to run topicality, and there are other more substantive issues the MG could focus on. So at a minimum, you really just want to find a good interpretation for your topic uh, or for the, the phrases that are relevant, and then, you know, just jot down a couple of standards. Don't write out, you know, entire shells. Just do a very basic outline of an MG response. If you have a coach helping you out in prep, delegating is a really good way to handle the prep burden. So have your coach try to find interpretations of phrases and then have the coach give you those phrases or those interpretations before you leave for the round. That can be a good way of sort of minimizing the time burden. Okay, so once you get to the MG, a couple of things you need to do. First, you need to make a we meet argument. Um, if you do not meet their interpretation and you know it, I don't care. Read a we meet argument. It is very, very easy to make, and it requires the negative to answer it, probably with a lot more time used than it takes for you to read it. Also, um, play dirty. Read 
two we meets. If you have two distinct we meets with separate warrants, and the negative only answers one, all you have to do to win in the PMR is extend the we meet that they didn't answer and it's game over. So if you read two we meets and they're distinct, that can be a good way of sort of cheating your way out of the T-shell. Um, your counterinterpretation. So every shell needs to have a counterinterpretation with at least uh, one or two reasons to prefer it. So that's non-negotiable. And if you do not have a counterinterpretation, the problem is that if topicality occurs in a competing interpretation framework and you don't have any interpretation to compete with, then you are screwed because your counterinterpretation forms the foundation of all of your offense. Strong counterinterpretations will ideally undercut the negative's interpretation. What I mean by that is you should take some standard that they have and uh, basically try to link turn it. So if, uh, for example, we consider limits, maybe the negative's interpretation limits the topic to 10 different cases, and the negative argues that they need to limit the topic to this many to make it fair for the negative and the app does not happen to be one of those 10 cases. If the affirmative can come up with an, an interpretation that has only five topical cases and the app is one of them, you've essentially turned the negative's limit standard because your interpretation limits the topic even more than the negative's does. So all the reasons why limits are good that the negative said in the LOC now become reasons why your interpretation is even better for that purpose than the negative's original interpretation. Usually to do that, you need to have a prepared interpretation ahead of time. So don't forget to do that. Also, don't forget to add an argument about why you meet your own counter-interpretation. That is a common mistake that many teams make, is they forget to provide a reason why they meet their own interpretation. When you provide, okay, next. When you provide counter-standards for your counter-interpretation, it should basically just be like, you know, uh, standards you'd run on the negative, except you just flip them, meaning that the reasons why um, your interpretation is better. Uh, you know, so sometimes um, a, lot of, a lot of teams try to find a good balance between reading counter standards and answering the LOC standards without taking a tremendous amount of time. Because it can take a lot of time if you're trying to both uh, answer the LOC standard, but also read new counter standards for your interpretation. Sometimes, if you don't want to spend a lot of time, you can do something called implicit clash, meaning that you can add implicit clash to your counter standards that are sort of responsive to the original LOC standards, but that don't necessarily require you to make a separate argument for it. So, for example, maybe the negative reads a limit standard and in the MG, you have a topic literature standard. You can make an argument that limits are most predictably dictated by the scope of topic literature. You're using your topic literature counter standard as a response to their limit standard. Next, at the voter level, reasonability. So many teams do a bad job of explaining reasonability. Many teams just say, we should only have to be reasonably topical, so don't vote for them, because we're reasonably topical. One, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Two, who decided you were reasonably topical? A better way of framing reasonability is like this. Evaluate topicality through the standard of reasonability. A reasonable interpretation of the topic is one that allows adequately sufficient conditions for a fair and educational debate to occur. A reasonable interpretation of the topic is one that allows adequately sufficient conditions for a fair and educational debate to occur. This is good because it's more specific, right? You don't need to win that your counterinterpretation is better than the LOC interpretation. You just need to win that it's good enough to have meaning, meaning, uh, meaningful debates that are fair and educational. This is also a good, uh, counter, uh, a good phrasing of reasonability to use because it allows you to demonstrate that you are reasonably topical through your counter standards. 
So you're not just asserting you're reasonably topical, you're using your counter standards to demonstrate that you do provide for a fair enough debate. And also, it's easy to justify reasonability because competing interpretations can become myopic, meaning that if the best interpretation always wins, it just creates a race to the bottom to see which side can limit out the most. It just becomes meaningless procedural debate that avoids discussion of substantive issues. And so reasonability can be a way of ensuring that topicality serves only its intended purpose, which is to check legitimate abuse. So likewise, you might also consider making an argument at the end of your shell, at the end of your MG response that says, don't vote for the negative unless they can prove that there was inbound abuse, that there's an actual reason for voting us down. Otherwise, we're simply voting in hypotheticals, and that detracts from the value of substantive debate. Any questions about the MG? I'm going to race through the last three speeches just in a couple of minutes. So, in the MO and the block, if you go for topicality in the block, it needs to be the central focus of your strategy. Do not try to pair topicality with something else and then try to half-ass it. You should spend at least six or seven minutes in the MO on topicality. You know, the last remaining minute can be used for things like answering MG theory or, you know, extending maybe like a couple of case arguments to force the PMR to spend time on those, but the majority of your strategy should be topicality. The first task for the MO is to extend the entire T shell, line by line. Extend your interpretation and violation as a response to their we meet argument. Explain why they don't meet your interpretation. If the MG gets nuanced in terms of why they meet your interpretation, then you should devote an appropriate amount of time to dissecting their arguments. So extend the entire shell, extend everything. On the standards debate, a lot of times what ends up happening between the LOC and the MG is that there's no direct clash. There's no responsiveness between the two competing sets of standards. There's simply reason to prefer each interpretation, but there's no weighing mechanism and there's no reasons for why other standards or other interpretations are bad. So you should provide this clash in the block. If you said that limits are good and the MG said that over-limiting is bad, then you need to go line by line and explain why limits are good. And you might have more reasons why limits are good and use those to answer their arguments about why limits are bad. Just swamp them with line-by-line -line analysis, especially because you will have a time-based advantage. Most MGs are not going to spend more than two minutes on answering topicality. You need to basically take that uh, and use it to your advantage by blowing up T. Next, ask yourself if they dropped or undercovered any of your standards. Find a standard that their interpretation does not capture and then make a really big deal out of it. So if they can see that topic literature is good and that your interpretation is the only one that provides topic literature, uh, is the only one with the basis in topic literature, then you should start arguing that topic literature is the gateway to every other standard in the round. Topic literature controls limits. It controls the quality and availability of ground. It provides a bright line that determines what cases fall within the topic and what doesn't on the basis that some cases appear in the literature and others don't. If you can win that one standard controls everything, is a gateway standard, that makes it incredibly important and it makes it so that it's very difficult for the negative, or I'm sorry, for the affirmative to come back from conceding or undercovering that standard. Try to nail down the standards debate to one standard that you're absolutely crushing the affirmative on. Spend like three or four minutes talking about it. It also pro provides the judge with a roadmap through which the judge can weigh different interpretations, especially if your interpretation captures the standard but the other interpretation does not. Finally, in the block, you should begin impact calculus. Impact calculus on topicality is essentially explaining the implications of different standards as they relate to one another. So what is more important? Is it more important 
to have, um, in discussions of limits, is it more important to have cases that are a, a large interpretation of the topic that promotes affirmative flexibility, that forces the negative to think on their feet, or is it more important to have more limited topics that ensure that debates are about the heart of the topic and are more educational, and which ensure fairness for the negative by permitting them access to predictable sets of generic arguments. Impact calculus is how we determine what set of implications matters more. Discuss all the implications of standards, why they matter, and why they matter more than the implications of your opponent's standards. That sort of comparative work is what needs to be done throughout the negative block. That is essentially how you define where abuse occurred, what the impact of topicality is. In the LOR, the LOR should mostly be impact calculus. It should mostly be comparing different standards to each other. However, the LOR must also anticipate. If the affirmative is in a whole, the LOR needs to anticipate the portion of the topicality debate that the PMAR is likely to focus the most on. I've seen teams go all in on reasonability for five minutes and come out winning despite the fact that they were losing literally every other part of the topicality flow. That's the main danger of reading topicality is if you fail to win every single part of the shell, you are in trouble. So the LOR needs to anticipate where the affirmative is strongest in topicality and then spend a lot of time preempting their analysis and allocate significant time to uh, buffering up your, um, your answer on that argument. So finally, the PMR. When you are trying to respond to topicality and the negative has made it a big part of the negative strategy, you need to do the same sort of impact calculus that the negative is doing. But finally, you also need to collapse. The PMR is time pressured. The PMR, there's no way that you can answer every single argument that is made in topicality. And the good thing is that you do not have to. You only need to win one portion of the T debate in order to win the round. You can win that you meet their interpretation. You can win that your interpretation is better than their interpretation. You can win that their standards are not warrants for their interpretation, i.e. that there is no basis for their interpretation because the, standard, the standards that they provide don't actually link back to their own interpretation. You can go for reasonability. You can go for competing interpretation bad. You can go for there's no abuse in the round, so you shouldn't vote. There are so many different portions of the debate that you can collapse to that it makes strategic sense to pick two or three of those arguments and spend two minutes on each one of them. That makes way more sense than spending 15 seconds on a variety of arguments that you can't really catch up the negative on in terms of time. So that is the core PMR strategy is to collapse. Any questions about topicality before I kick you out and you head down to uh, topic announce? Okay, so that's all. Thank you for your attention.